there we go. Thank you, Susie. And can you everybody hear me? I hope. Um, yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, I want to first welcome everybody who's here as a guest. Um, I know that there are people here who belong to the groups that Sue and I belong to, uh, artists from the Southwest Society of Botanical Artists and also from the Botanical Artists Guild of Southern California and a special welcome to Akiko who is here from Japan. Thank you, Akiko. It's lovely to have you here tonight. Stu and I are botanical artists and botany on paper is what we do with our passion for plants. Tonight, we want to give you something to think about. If you jump in and draw plants too, you will be greatly rewarded, really. As with many concepts, botany on paper covers a wide spectrum. On one end of that spectrum is the herbarium specimen, a pressed and dried plant attached to paper for scientific reference purposes. A photograph would also qualify as botany on paper, but accurate non-photographic representation of plants on paper is generally sorted into two categories, botanical creation and botanical art. The Huntington made an informative video on this topic last year, and we do have permission to share that with you tonight. It's a seven minute video, and afterwards we'll talk more about how botanical drawing can make a difference to you out in the field. I'll describe some of the research that has studied the effects of drawing on learning and memory. And we'll also hear some personal testimonials, uh, one of them from the grave. And finally, we'll pay tribute to a few notable Arizona botanical artists and illustrators. And I'm going to let Lynn show the video. All three of these artworks feature plants, but only one is considered botanical art. Which one and why? To answer these questions, let's begin by looking at two 18th century artistic depictions of plants. Here we see a page from Maria Isabella Marion's Metamorphoses and a page from Elizabeth Blackwell's Curious Herbal. Both artists carefully observed plants and used artistic techniques to copy the plant to the page as accurately as possible. This 18th century style of work branched into two similar but distinct styles. Botanical art and botanical illustration. Botanical illustration is scientific illustration that shows the entire life cycle of the plant from seed to full grown plant. It also shows all the parts of the plant. This video focuses on the other genre, botanical art. Botanical art is scientific and artistic. Unlike botanical illustration, botanical art does not need to include the entire life cycle of the plant. It also does not need to include all the parts of the plant. However, Botanical art is always scientifically accurate with every part of the plant it depicts. Like in Blackwell and Marion's time, botanical artists want their work to be useful to scientists. Look at this artichoke from the Huntington's garden side by side with the botanical artwork of an artichoke. What similarities do you see? What differences? In this artichoke example, we can see several features of botanical art. First, we see a single plant. In the photograph, we can see flowers and leaves from several different plants, but in the botanical artwork, the artist has only included the artichoke. We also see a neutral background. 
The flowers and leaves in the photo's background make it difficult to see the artichoke's features. In botanical art, artists use simple backgrounds to keep the focus on the plant. Anything included in the background must contribute to the viewer's understanding of the plant. Lastly, we see defined features. Both the photograph and the botanical artwork display the same parts of the plant, the stalk, the leaves, and the bracts. Bracts are special leaves that protect a flower bud. However, in the botanical artwork, the artist has clearly defined the features of the stalk, the leaves, and the bracts. One of the main goals of botanical art is to convey factual information about a plant. In this way, botanical art is scientific. The other main goal of botanical art is to evoke a response from the viewer. In this way, botanical art is artistic. Botanical artists want their work to be visually interesting, so they consider the principles of design, balance, emphasis, movement, pattern, proportion, repetition, rhythm, unity, and variety. When choosing how to create the artwork, botanical artists make decisions based on the elements of art, line, shape, form, space, texture, and color. As you look at the following botanical artworks, what do you notice about how the artists use the principles of design and the elements of art? In this video, my commentary will focus on how the artists use the elements of art. However, if you are familiar with the principles of design, I recommend looking out for those as well. With these pieces, we can see how the lines, shapes, and forms will differ depending on the angle the artist chooses. Each of these works would look very different from a different angle. Different parts of a plant have different textures. The artist needs to choose which technique or techniques they want to use to show these textures to the viewer. In this botanical artwork, the fruits are smooth, whereas the leaves are rough. We can also see how the artist uses the space around the objects to emphasize the leaves' rough edges. Artists make decisions about how they want to color the plant. The amount of light and the position of the light source affect the plant's colors. Does the artist want to create their art in color or in black and white? Colors are known to affect people's emotions, so the two pieces we see likely make viewers feel different things. How do they make you feel? Botanical artists also make choices about media. Media are the artistic materials an artist uses to create an artwork. Different media feel different to work with and create different visual effects on the page. The artwork on the left was created using graphite and watercolor on vellum. Vellum is a writing surface made out of preserved calfskin, and it was common in the Middle Ages in Europe, but is not used much anymore. The artwork on the right was created using colored pencil on paper. Think about how the different materials create different visual effects. Botanical artists consider each of these elements of art when creating their work. Botanical art is both scientific and artistic. Returning to the original three images we saw, we can see that the image on the left depicts multiple types of flowers and leaves. It is a plant painting, but it is not botanical art. The image in the center depicts the different life stages of a plant and it shows every part of the plant. It is a botanical illustration. The image on the right with its scientifically accurate depictions of a single plant and its emphasis on artistry is a piece of botanical art. Thank you for joining me today in our exploration of botanical art. Thank you to the artists of the Botanical Artists Guild of Southern California. Thank you, Lynn. You're welcome. Back to you. 
All right. So now that we know the difference between botanical art and botanical illustration, you'll immediately understand that scientists need and want botanical illustration for reference purposes, identification purposes, and documentation of specimens that might be rare or difficult to examine in situ. But if you are out in the field, like these botanists, and you come upon a plant that could be one thing or might be another, and you're not carrying your right library in your backpack, then what can you do to identify it? Removing the plant or pressing a specimen might not be an option. So what a lot of us do these days is snap a photo with our phone. And there's nothing wrong with that. But ask yourself, when you get back to your library or the herbarium, does your photo have enough accuracy to help you key it out? Maybe, maybe not. Another consideration, say you go to a knowledgeable person and want their help in identifying the plant. How well can you describe it if all you have is one photo on your phone? That's where botanical drawing comes in. We promise you, if you take five minutes to draw a sketch or a diagram of your plant, you will know much more about its details for future conversations. And you'll also remember more of those details in your long-term memory. I'm told that Diane sketches almost every day on her back patio. No wonder she knows so much about plants. Drawing requires you to use skills from many different parts of your brain, from the visual part of your brain back here at the back, from the spatial part of your brain over here on the right side, from the verbal part of your brain on the left for most of us, the semantic or the thinking portion of our brain and the frontal lobes up here, and even obviously with your hand, your, your motor skills. And I'm gonna share a couple of studies with you showing how we know this. Canadian researchers asked subjects to learn a list of words, and then they tested the subject's recall. Group one was always the baseline group, and they were asked to write down the words. Group two was asked to draw a picture of each one of the words. And then they were tested for their recall. And the group that did the drawing had the best recall. So they did it again and they asked group one to write the list of words many times. And they asked group two to draw the pictures many times. And the drawing group still had better recall. So then, um, they finally studied four different groups and group one wrote down the words. Group two didn't use their hands at all. They just sat there and visualized the objects in their imagination. Group three was given pictures of each one of the words and they were told to trace the pictures. And group four was told to do the original drawings. And the best recall by far was the group that did the original drawings. So the researchers concluded that the integration of multiple brain areas using language, imagination, and motor skills was responsible for the improvement in recall. In further studies, they also documented longer recall. Studies in children demonstrated similar improvements in learning and retention, particularly in science. Educators now being encouraged and trained to incorporate drawing skills in their lessons. Studies also found that drawing enhanced memory in older adults more than other known study or learning techniques. Um, as we've all begun to learn, retention of new information typically declines as people age due to deterioration of some of our rather critical brain structures like our hippocampus, which you won't see in this diagram, but also our frontal lobes tend to shrink as we age. And so in contrast, we know that the visuospatial processing areas of the brain back here in the back tend to remain intact, both with normal aging and in dementia. And so it's felt that drawing is gonna be very relevant for people with dementia because it makes use 
of brain regions that are still well preserved. And it could also help people who are having some cognitive impairment just with their brain, with their memory function. Many of the studies were very general in scope, but a few of them were particular to biology. And one of them was specifically about plant taxonomy. And this study was done in the UK. Um, they took 41 adult botanical novices and they studied a whole group of uh, UK native plant species using two different methods. The first method was descriptive writing. And the second method was drawing a picture and labeling the picture with the uh, features of the plant. And then they tested the group to see how well they could identify the different species. And they found that um, both methods were equally effective at improving species identification, but that drawing would capture significantly more of the morphological information about all the species that the writing did. And the participants preferred the drawing. So all these studies emphasize that the drawing did not have to be good to be effective at increasing learning and retention. Just having drawn the drawing made the magic happen. So I'm gonna encourage you to put a little pad and a pencil and a ruler or just draw your ruler on the edge of your pad and put it in your backpack. Or you can do like crime pays, but botany does it and tattoo your finger if you want to, but you really can learn more about your plants out in the field if you take a minute to do a drawing. Here's another endorsement for the value of drawing your observations. Jim Folsom, who's the recently retired director of the Botanical Gardens at the Huntington, has made a video called Drawing Upon Nature. And there's about a minute and a half in this video where he talks about how his own drawings convinced his graduate advisor that his research was valid. And so I'm gonna let Lynn show us that minute and a half. Okay, here we go again. Um relationship and I decided I would have to draw each flower so that I could compare them um, in relative scale and I could um, explain the physical differences that that led to how they were pollinated. I sat about in my clunky way and, and I took graph paper because I, I'm having to draw this to scale and I'm, I want to make sure that I get all the things right and I didn't take an image and project it on the paper and trace it because it's three dimensional, you can't quite do that. So I took a, um, I sat down and drew them all and I was taking my drawings to discuss them with, um, with a really excellent um, taxonomist, Dr. Um, Bob Crawl at Vanderbilt, which is where I was working. And, and Bob looked at the, at the illustration. He said, there's no way that flower looks like that. And I'm flabbergasted because I'm thinking like, um, I, I sat there for hours, I mean, labored over this pencil, drawing, erasing, drawing, erasing, because I'm not a good artist, right? I can't just do this. And I sit there for hours and I have looked at this flower and I have drawn it and all the dots connect and all the points connect. And I'm, and, and I'm so the good thing is I'm very confident that I'm right. And so I'm showing him this illustration and he's saying they don't look like that. And I said, well, you may look for yourself. So we're in an herbarium. An herbarium is like a library, but it's hundreds and thousands of sheets of paper with plants glued to them. So Dr. Crawl gets up from his desk, walks over to the cabinet where the orchids are. He finds, he pulls this out, he pulls out a sheet and he's looking at the sheet and he was stunned. He said, I can't believe this. That's how it looks. I had never, because he's collected the plant, he's seen it before, but he's never sat down and drawn it. Wonderful. Thank you, Lynn. You're welcome. I hope I've gotten everybody thinking about how much fun it could be to draw plants, or at least how valuable it might be. 
Um, now, Sue and I are going to talk about a few of Arizona's most distinguished botanical artists and illustrators. And I'm going to lead off talking about Sarah Plummer Lemon. Many of you remember Wynne Brown's presentation to our group a couple of years ago. And Wynne has graciously given me permission to use um, some of the images of Sarah's paintings. To refresh your memory, Wynne has written a biography of this remarkable woman for whom our own Mount Lemon is named. Although Sarah Lemon was born in Maine, lived most of her adult life in California, she and her husband, John Gill Lemon, are responsible for identifying over 10% of all the vascular plants that are known to be native to Arizona. The forgotten botanist, Sarah Plummer Lemon's life in science and art is being published by the University of Nebraska Press this fall. And for pre-orders, the website there, winbrown.com forward slash research is where you can go to get on the list if you'd like to pre-order the book. Like many women of her era, Sarah's early education included drawing and painting lessons. Sarah used those skills not just to earn money by teaching students and illustrating various publications, but also to teach herself botany. Wynne's research reveals that Sarah wrote and illustrated pamphlets about the various sea plants along Santa Barbara's beaches when she first arrived in California. She did the same with ferns that she identified on her walks uh, around the local area. Her art training made her such a keen observer that she began identifying previously undescribed species. Botany was a very popular pastime after the Civil War and amateur botanists found ways to network. Sarah Plummer began her own retail shop and established a library in Santa Barbara. She also organized a local salon gathering on a regular basis to hear lectures, discuss books and current events, and more or less filling the need for ongoing education and learning for curious adults. Sarah's academic background included a teaching degree in physical education postgraduate training in chemistry and physics. Wynne believes Sarah's natural intellectual curiosity led to using her keen skills of observation and her artistic ability to teach herself botany. It's believed that John Gill Lemon, another amateur botanist from North California, was a guest lecturer at Sarah's salon in Santa Barbara. Their common interests eventually led to their marriage in 1880. As a team, the Lens made several botanizing trips to Arizona, shipping their specimens and their observations to renowned academic botanists throughout the United States, including Asa Gray and Serena Watson at Harvard, George Engelman in St. Louis, and others. From the Gray Herbarium Library at Harvard, I'd like to share a portion of one of Sarah's letters to Dr. Gray where she talks about the creosote and she talks about a relative of our native cotton plant. And I believe this supports Wynne's contention that Sarah informed her botanical inquiries with her drawings. Now for a passing word as to special work. Soon after our return from Arizona this season, at a regular meeting of the California Academy of Science, I ventured a brief report with illustrations upon the blackboard and a watercolor sketch made upon the plains, upon that peculiar twist in the claw of the petals of Larea mexicana. In sketching the plant, that peculiarity attracted my attention as it does not appear in herbarium specimens. The twist in the claw causes the petal to invariably stand longitudinal to the axis of the plant. As I had never seen a plant behave this way before, it proved very interesting. Wonder if this has any relation to the similar behavior of leaves that we often notice in the South. Also in sketching the Ingenhousia trinoba, it was noticed that the petals are invariably dimidiate. In its home, in full vigor, it is a beautiful plant and I enjoyed sketching its bright, airy foliage and showy flowers. And now I'm just speculating here, but when I saw these marks in the margin, I'm imagining that Asa Gray was saying, I wanna go look that up. No, 
she's describing something she saw in her drawings and that he's taking it very seriously. So I say good for you, Sarah. Sarah probably made hundreds of paintings of the plants that she and John collected. This photograph of Sarah and J.G. Lemon's herbarium in Oakland, California shows some of them. Few of the paintings have survived, quite likely because of the devastating fires after the 1906 San Francisco earthquake, which gutted the California Academy of Sciences. In that fire, 100,000 plant specimens were lost, and Wynne believes from her extensive research that Sarah's botanical paintings may have been housed there. It is so inspirational to be making botanical art in the shadow of the only mountain on our planet named for a botanical artist. Southern Arizona is home to many accomplished botanical artists and Sue is going to review some of those with us now. Okay, thank you, Melanie. That was great information about Sarah and about the need to be drawing. Is the sound coming through okay? Yes. Okay, that's great. I'd like to talk to you now about two different programs that are happening in Tucson that cover botanical art. And the first is the Desert Legume Program. This is a program that's uh, co-founded by the Boyce Thompson Arboretum and our University of Arizona Agriculture Division. They are receiving legume seeds and also line drawings of legume plants from deserts around the world. And currently they have 67 different countries represented. So if you go to their website, you can see a lot of the nice line drawings. Or if you drive at the, to, along the agricultural campus plots on Allen Street, you might be some of the research, you might see some of the research that they're doing to investigate how well many of these leg, legumes can grow in, in the Sonoran Desert area. They are saving the seeds, storing them into perpetuity so they can be pulled out later if need be. The next program is the Sonoran Desert Florilegium Program. A florilegium is a flower book or collection of botanical illustrations. And if you go on the website for the Sonoran Desert Flor Florilegium, you'll see just beautiful botanical illustrations from 15 different artists at the moment. And you see the website right there. And uh, there's also going to be a document that's going to be saved when this recording is published and you will see a lot of the websites there that so you can get to them. So the Flora Legium has been working in cooperation with our, their herbarium on the university campus and they have been look, going through botanical illustrations that are stored at the herbarium and they've been scanning them and putting them in archival mounting so they will last for into perpetuity really and bless their hearts they're putting in the time to do that. I'd now like to talk to you about a few of the local botanical artists and that uh, either have historically been here in Arizona or in this in one case still he's here. The first is Cora Cameron Mosier. Cora moved to Phoenix in 1925 and she would go out into the desert each day with her colored pencil and paper and she would draw what she saw around her. Well it was too hot for her in Phoenix so she moved up on the rim but she still went out every day with her colored pencil and paper and she would draw what she saw around her. Well, when she died, they put all of her botanical illustrations, mounted them in books and put them in a suitcase and they went and ended up in some of her relatives um, attics. Well, so at one point, one of the relatives was cleaning out her attic, found this suitcase and said, Oh, my God, look at here is Cora's uh, botanical art. And so this relative took the art into the Natural History Museum at BYU in Provo and um, and said, look at this, you know, what do you think of all this? And the BYU representative said, oh my God, this is incredible. <clears throat> Excuse me. Well, there's, these are so accurate and detailed. We can put scientific names on these. And so they did. They went through all of them, put scientific names on them. And then they had an exhibit of Cora Mosier's paintings in the Natural History Museum. Well, a little bit later, 
<clears throat> one of the grandsons took these paintings into the Antiques Roadshow that was happening in Salt Lake City at the time. And the Antiques Roadshow said, these are marvelous. So they pulled the grandson <clears throat> up to the center podium and had the grandson talk about things. Excuse me. So you can see a lot of this at the website, Cora Mosher Floral Art. You can also find a link to the Antiques Roadshow segment. And we have to thank our plant press editors for the marvelous uh, article they did recently in the plant press, many pages about Cora and reproductions of her paintings. <clears throat> And the next artist is Lucretia Hamilton. Lucretia graduated from the University of Arizona in 1932. She had a degree in botany and a minor in art. And she did just marvelous line drawings of plants. And her professors were so impressed with her. They said, will you please illustrate our work? And also researchers wanted her to help them with the illustrations. So she became quite involved in a number of technical papers and books. And um, you can see a lot of her work on the Floralegium website because the Floralegium people, bless their hearts, went into the herbarium on the university campus where many of Cora's paintings were just stacked up and they scanned them and put them in archival mounting. So we can now see those online and they are stored forever. Here's one of Lucretia's um, Pinio serious gregii, and you can see that she's done it very much scientifically accurate. She's dissected the flower, she's dissected the seed pod, she's got all the pieces and parts, and it's a very nice rendition. Well, one of our great local artists, Margaret Pope, said, you know, I want to put the parts together so that I can understand it better. So she did that and she put the tuber underground and she put all the parts together so you can see all the pieces and parts fit together and you can kind of understand better how that plant grows. Well, Margaret, as you may recall, was the artist for our AZNPS state wildflower poster. And Margaret did all of these flowers for the poster in a much larger version. And then they took them to the printer who scanned them and reduced them and arranged them so that's now available to us if, 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 when we get it from our AZNPS, our state wildflower poster. I have this in my hallway and I just smile every time I go by it. It's just a wonderful thing. And then on the right, we have a beautiful rendition of our iron wood that's going to be blooming soon in the desert done by Margaret Pope. And the last artist I'd like to talk to you about is Frank Rose. And many of you remember Frank Rose because he attended most of our meetings. And in fact, he talked to us a couple times about various topics that he was involved in. Frank was a minister. And when he retired, he went into his avocation, which was botany. He did many, many wonderful, beautiful watercolor portraits of the plants that we have around us. And if you want to get a good compilation of his watercolor paintings, then buy the book Catalina Mountains that has most of it in there. Well, Frank would take people up in the Catalina Mountains once a week and they would hike around and they would be, uh, look for what was in bloom and what they could see around them. And Frank, I'm sure, would love to have sat down and done drawing or drawing with a brush of what he saw right there, but that would kind of drag the group down. So he had a piece of black velvet cloth and he would wrap that around the back of the plant and he would take a photo. And the black velvet really showed off the flower structure and the leaf structure so he could understand that better. And when I look at many of his paintings, I can kind of see that dark background behind the plants and it really does show off the structure of the plants. He had a good technique there, a good idea. You can see on the left, the dark background again, at least in my imagination, I could see him with his dark black velvet cloth against this mimulus. Well, it's not a mimulus anymore, it's an erythrantha. And Frank, bless his heart, he got the correct genus name in before the book was published, so the book is now correct. The picture on the right reminds me of how well he portrayed all of our desert plants. And I look at this picture of all the wildflowers and my heart just sings. <clears throat> my husband and I used to like to go to his gallery openings and being plant lovers, we would really enjoy this because we could look at each painting and we would know what it was instead of some kind of loose vague thing, yellow flowers, I don't know what they are. No, you could tell what these things were and it just was wonderful.
And here's the last one I want to show you of Frank's. Again, there's kind of that dark background behind the Penstemons, and you can imagine him with his black velvet cloth. Well, I have kind of a personal story. I have this herbaceous thing that's growing in my yard and I didn't know what it was. And so before one of our AZNPS meetings, I grabbed a snatch of it and I came into the meeting and I asked several of our senior AZNPS members, do you know what this is? Do you know what this is? And nobody did. And finally I went up to Frank and I said, do you know what this is? He said, well, it's Bebe Agencia. Now here's Frank. He knew things where nobody else did. How did he know this? And I'm thinking it's because he drew them or drew it with a brush and it was embedded into his brain and he understood the structure and he really had a very good memory. And so I have to thank him for that. Well, as we finish up here, I want to thank you for coming. And I want to do that in the guise of a note that Sarah Lemon sent to one of her friends. She said, dear friend, we wish that you may have reached home in time for the festivities of the holidays and that you are in excellent health, that you will be well blessed in the coming year botanically and in every other way. And so we wish this for you, that you are in excellent health and that you will be well blessed in the coming year botanically and in every other way. I want to thank you for coming and I hope you enjoyed the presentation and I wonder now if you have any questions. <laughs>